of the most interesting Bible studies I've ever done. As I was preparing for teaching and preaching. into the theme of revival. I was surprised that uh, there was that much about revival in the Bible and that there were so many revivals described in the Bible. I don't know why I was surprised about that, but uh, I was. A revival is, is not a term that uh, we have used very much, at least in my experience, in churches of Christ through the years, though I've certainly come across many churches in our fellowship that needed revival, and I've met many individuals that were looking for revival in their own personal life. Now, we haven't used the term much, probably for one of two reasons, either one We've sort of been scared of the word because it's been a word that we think has been abused by other groups. Or two, we're comfortable and complacent and don't feel a need for revival. Both those reasons, frankly, stink, to be very blunt. I've never felt that it was wise or good to avoid using a word because someone else misused it or abused it. And I think complacency and comfort are a scourge among the people of God and ought to be stamped out. We all need revived at times, uh, personally, certainly, and also certainly, I think, congregationally. Now, if you read the dictionary definition of revival, it really doesn't sound all that threatening. The example that I saw, uh, here are the definitions. Number one, to, to bring back to life, to resuscitate. Number two, to bring back to a healthy, vigorous, or flourishing condition after a decline. And number three, to become valid, effective or operative again. God's people have always needed revival individually and as a group. Don't you feel from time to time a need to be revived? I know that I do and the problem with revival is that there really isn't a 12-step program that you can follow or a, you know, a simple one, two, three uh, to be revived. The Bible doesn't say, you know, push this button or that button and, and you'll be revived. Rather, what it does is it shows us examples of God's people in decline and then coming out of that decline as they are revived. And I'd like us to look at one uh, excellent example of that today. It's an example of revival among God's people that took place a long time ago. I just want us to notice it and to ask what were the characteristics of their revival and how could those things affect my faith and um, e even the, the work of this congregation here in Lancaster. The one I'm referring to is in the book of 2 Chronicles, and uh, beginning in chapter 29, 2 Chronicles 29. Talk about a people in need of revival. Think about the nation of Judah after the reign of a king named Ahaz. He became king when he was 20 and reigned until he was 36, and those in those 16 years, he almost single-handedly destroyed the faith of that nation. The nation became devotees of the Canaanite god Baal, not the god of Israel. And things like child sacrifice 
became a part of their worship this, among the people of God. The nation, uh, God's chosen people, were falling apart. They were heading toward complete disaster. And it wasn't just that they had sort of a tired faith. In so many ways, their faith was dead. So if there was ever a people in need of revival, it was them. You know, if, if we were God, we would have written them off. But God didn't. We would have given up on them. We would have pronounced them dead spiritually. Uh, but the Lord, he just raised up a, a leader to bring them back, to lead the revival. His name was Hezekiah. So if you look at chapter 29 of, of Second Chronicles, just notice the first couple of verses there where we're introduced to this leader. It says Hezekiah began to reign when he was 25 years old, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord according to all that David, his father, had done. That phrase, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. You see, the groundwork is being laid there for revival among God's people. You have a good, godly leader um, that has arisen among them. And Hezekiah's first order of business in the first month of his reign is focused on the spiritual life of the people. He opens up the temple that the wicked King Ahaz had actually boarded up. Can you imagine? He had boarded up the worship place. Look at verse 3 of that same chapter. It says, In the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. Amazing that that had to be done. But it did. And really, for almost 200 years, the temple, which was the center of spiritual life at that time among God's people, it had been gathering cobwebs. It had been totally neglected. It was in disuse. And so Hezekiah, first thing, sets out to fix it up. He, he sets out to, to renovate the house of God. He gathers the priests um, and the Levites, and he says, clean yourselves up and then clean up the temple. And sacrifices were renewed at the temple. Um, the spiritual leaders were revived. And then in chapter 30, it's very interesting what happens there. The great Passover feast is finally celebrated again. And it says that thousands are in attendance. You recall, don't you, what Passover was all about? What was it about Passover was so important? Once a year, they were to remember God's salvation. They were to remember God's deliverance of Israel from slavery in Egypt. When they celebrated Passover, they were remembering God saving them from bondage in a foreign land bringing them up to a new land, giving them a new life. For years, they hadn't celebrated Passover. For years, they had forgotten the salvation of God. They forgot what slavery was like. They weren't thankful for what God had done for them. Now, this sometimes happens to Christians. It happens sometimes to churches. You take a, a Christian who was baptized years ago and sometimes they have forgotten what it was like to be saved. That's, that's why the Lord gave us the example of taking his supper, not once in a while, but every Sunday so we won't forget. We have a tendency to forget even our salvation. And so... We take it every week, lest we forget. You ever been to a unhappy, joyless wedding? Now, I haven't, 
You know, weddings are, are celebrations. They're, they're optimistic times, or they're happy, joyful times, and you know, excitement is in the air. The bride is beautiful. The, the groom is handsome, maybe for the first and only time in his life. <laughs> but you can see between those two, the love, it, it's obvious, and it's just a, a great time. And, and then, sometimes 10 or 15 years later, you see two people who don't even like each other anymore. What happened? Well, it's the same things that, that happened to God's people, Judah, in Hezekiah's day. It's the same thing that can happen to Christians. They've forgotten the joy of that initial experience. They need to revive it. That's what happens here in chapter 30, 2 Chronicles. The people are remembering. They're remembering their God. They're remembering their salvation experience. And so they celebrate Passover for seven days. And it's interesting because they're so excited, so thankful. I want you to notice what happens, verse 23. Then the whole assembly agreed together to keep the feast for another seven days. So they kept it for another seven days with gladness. They worshiped God for two full weeks at the temple. They were revived. You know, revival, it doesn't happen once a year during a special meeting, a gospel meeting, or a revival meeting, whatever we call it. It doesn't happen, you know, at a, at a weekend youth rally. Revival is a thing that is sustained. It is continuous. It makes a lasting difference. For three decades in Judah, during the reign of King Hezekiah, for 30 years there was renewal, revival. And I just want, to, want us to notice today three specific things that happened we might uh, think of them as characteristics of true revival. And as we notice them, let's apply them to us. The first characteristic is obvious. We've talked about it already. Worship. Uh, every revival is characterized by true and exciting worship. Same here in, in Hezekiah's reign. If you look at it, chapter 30, verse 23 tells us they were so thrilled with their renewed relationship with the Lord that they decided to extend their time of celebration for another seven days. They couldn't get enough. You see, revival had come to them. When was the last time that we didn't care what the clock said when we were in the place of worship? Now, our world pressures us to be very clock conscious, doesn't it? I just mentioned clocks, and some of you glanced at your phone, didn't you? <laughs> it's always a consideration when, when we plan our worship times, and I'm not saying that's all bad, that we shouldn't pay any attention. I'm just saying... I want you to notice what happens when true revival comes. The clock isn't so important. The calendar fades a bit in, in our minds. And one thing that, that COVID did to us, folks, was make us awful conscious of time. We weren't just worried during COVID about social distancing. We were, we were worried about that, but, but we also worried about time together. And frankly, for, for way too many people, that hasn't gone away. We're struggling with it still. Just being honest today, folks. Some of us got out of some good habits during COVID. 
Habits related to how often we assemble with fellow believers. Habits related to how long we assemble. There are some things that need revived among us. Real revival is characterized by genuine worship. Second characteristic of real revival is repentance. You see, great devotion and worship without repentance does no good. Now, it's possible to, to get people stirred up to push the right buttons and, and manipulate an, an emotional high in people, to fire them up into a frenzy. Uh, and, and there are some Christian groups out there that have become experts, frankly, at doing just that. There is a way to do it. There is a formula. It's not a great secret. And if you're willing to do those things and abuse those things, you can do it. So excitement and thrilling worship experiences, that kind of thing, is not all there is to revival. There must also be repentance, cleansing. That is real change. In the opening verses of chapter 31, back in 2 Chronicles, there is change. There is repentance in Israel. Notice verse 1 says, Now when all this was finished, that is all the worship that they had done for two weeks, all Israel who were present went out to the cities of Judah and broke in pieces the pillars and cut down the ashram and broke down the high places and the altars throughout all Judah and Benjamin and in Ephraim and Manasseh until they had destroyed them all. Then all the people of Israel returned to their cities. See, they could have done that two weeks of, of great celebrative worship um, to the Lord and then just went back to their old way of doing things after those two weeks were over. And it really would not have made a difference at all in their lives in the long run. But they repented. They changed. They went out, they cleansed the land of idols. They tore down those things that were pulling them away from God destroyed the shrines and so forth. So, you see, any worship that excites and stimulates, thrills, but doesn't cause us to change, doesn't push us to repentance, is dangerous. Real revival demands repentance. It calls on us to change the way we think and act and the way we behave. Last characteristic of real revival that we notice here is generosity. What happens after worship and repentance? Well, in Judah... At this time, you have a group of people that, that are rededicated to the Lord. They need to be spiritually nourished. You have a temple and a priesthood that needs maintained. You have things that need to be done. They can't celebrate Passover forever. They can't be at the temple all year long. They've got to go back to their own towns. How is spiritual life going to be maintained? by the generosity of the people. Listen for a moment to the amazing thing that happened here. It begins in verse 3 of chapter 31. The contribution of the king from his own possessions was for the burnt offerings, the burnt offerings of morning and evening, and the burnt offerings for the Sabbaths, the new moons, and the appointed feast, as it is written in the law of the Lord. And he commanded the people who lived in Jerusalem to give the portion due to the priests and the Levites that they might give themselves to the law of the Lord. 
As soon as the command was spread abroad, the people of Israel gave in abundance the first fruits of grain, wine, oil, honey, and all the produce of the field. And they brought in abundantly the tithe of everything. And the people of Israel and Judah who lived in the cities of Judah also brought in the tithe of cattle and sheep and the tithe of the dedicated things that had been dedicated to the Lord their God and laid them in heaps. In the third month, they began to pile up the heaps and finish them in the seventh month. When Hezekiah and the princes came and saw the heaps, they blessed the Lord and his people Israel. And Hezekiah questioned the priests and the Levites about the heaps. Azariah, the chief priest, who was of the house of Zadok, answered him, Since they began to bring the contributions into the house of the Lord, we have eaten and had enough and had plenty left. For the Lord has blessed his people so that we have this large amount left. True revival is evidenced by the generosity of the revived. The Bible says that as soon as the word spread, the people gave in abundance the first fruits of their labors. Their giving was cheerful, it was willing. And it was generous. It was also priority giving. That's what the term first fruits means. Their giving to the Lord and his work came first. They considered what they would give to God before they considered what they would spend on other things. They gave their best, they gave it first. And they did it with a cheerful, revived heart. Let me ask you to consider what priority God has in your personal budget. Is he first? If not, why not? Isn't God supposed to be first in everything? What do we call things that we put first before God? We call them idols. Do we need revived in our priorities? Their generosity and their giving was also based, you notice there, on a percentage. They gave a tenth, um, a tithe. That's 10%, of course. That was the Old Testament standard that was in the law. It was the standard for generous giving. What's the New Testament standard? We're not given a percentage. We don't have a law in the New Testament about a percentage. You know, we're not given uh, a statement that says you need to give X percent to be faithful to God. I wonder why that is. I think... Part of the answer to that is that we're no no longer under law, but under grace. Romans chapter 6, verse 14. But but being under grace doesn't mean, oh, cool, now I can give less. It actually means, wow, I have the freedom to give more. If you're interested in in pursuing this, I encourage you to go look at Jesus' great sermon. That's in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Just read his sermon. And one of the things our Lord does there is he takes the old law and contrasts it to what he's bringing in his kingdom, the kingdom standards that he's ushering in. And so he says things like this. He says... The old law said, don't murder. But I say to you, don't even hate. And then he says, the old law says, don't commit adultery. But I say to you, don't even lust. And he does this 
several times. Now, in that sermon, he doesn't address exactly what we're talking about here, but I just want you to imagine if he, if he had. If he had said, the old law said, give 10%, what do you think he would have said about life in his kingdom? What do you think he would have said about what to give? It's at least something to think about, isn't it? Jesus, in fact, did say in that sermon, Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, these words. He said, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. True revival is characterized by true generosity. Wouldn't it be something to have the problem that Hezekiah and the priests had on that occasion? What was the problem? The people were so generous. They had these heaps of offerings that they had to deal with, more than they needed. And that would be an amazing thing in the kingdom of God. If, if we had to decide, what are we going to do with all this? True revival, vibrant faith is characterized by worship, by repentance, and by generosity. I want us to close with prayer. And I want to pray with you portion of one of the psalms, Psalm 85, to get us to think about this as we speak to our God. Would you bow with me? Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of your people. You forgave the sin of your people. Restore us again, O God of our salvation. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. We thank you, Father, for the salvation you've given us in Christ, our Savior, our Lord. And help us, Father, to worship to, when we need, repent and to be generous because of what he has done for us. Pray your blessing on each one here today as they go into this next year, that it will be a joyous time for them in your kingdom. Thank you for hearing us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning. The invitation of Jesus is extended to you if you need to come before God for some reason this morning and commit yourself to him. We uh, rejoice to help you in that. We pray with you, serve you in whatever way we can. Think about that while together we stand and sing.